We are in the book of? In what chapter? Oh, very good. Well done. Well done. Excellent. So um, Acts chapter 16 is, is a case study in four, the lives of four people. Uh, and uh, the first is that of a rich woman. The second is that of an enslaved girl. The third is that of the enslaved girl's owners. And finally, a prison guard. And what we're going to see is like, like a stone or a pebble being tossed into a lake. That one life change is going to change all the lives. That, that these people's lives are going to be changed in such a way that the world is going to be changed. And like most things, it all flew, f uh, flowed from, flew from, it all flowed from botched travel plans. <laughs> right? Isn't that how, how your life works? So we got, we got several people. We got Paul, we have Silas, and we have Timothy. And now... Paul and Silas and Timothy are joined by a fourth person that we have to kind of read between the lines to understand who it is. Anybody know who joined him? Luke. Luke, you are my father. Uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but in any case, uh, because now Luke, who is the writer of the book of Acts, he now begins to refer to himself as we. We did this. We went there. We did all these things. So Paul, Silas, Timothy, and now Luke are beginning to travel around. Basically, what they do is they kind of ambled around their old stomping grounds in Galatia and all these areas. And they were, they were thinking that they could probably, that they wanted to take the, the, um, the gospel to a Roman province that occupied the western end of, end of modern Turkey. Can you, can you kind of picture Turkey in your head, where that is across the sea from Italy? Uh, going east, you got the Black Sea, and uh, the, the Turkey is kind of within that general area down below it and such. That's kind of where they are wanting to go. Uh, they called that, in those days, they called that Asia. And they wanted to go there, but God said no. So over the course of a season of discernment that lasted probably about two or three weeks, they walked around. And they tried to figure out where are we supposed to go? Where, where are we supposed to go be and what we're supposed to do? They kind of envisioned their life like a 10-speed bicycle or a multi-speed bicycle. You ever tried to shift a multi-speed bicycle without pedaling it? It doesn't work, right? And that's the way the Christian life is. We are to go, therefore. We are to move. We are to do things. We're supposed to be active within our faith. That's how we test our faith. That's how we find things out. And so they began walking. For two to three weeks, they walked. So they probably walked a couple of hundred miles. But this span of discernment within Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke's life, it, it led to important things. For example, uh, I don't know if you've ever had to spend a lot of time with somebody that you, you work with. Right now you go, no, I haven't seen the people I work with for two years, right? Um, but when you, when you spend a lot of time with the people you work with, you have to develop a working relationship, right? Paul and Silas, they had new situations going on within their lives, and so they had to find new ways of working together. They had to find out how that work was going to work, how they were going to be together. Timothy, who Paul kind of picked up along the way, and read, read the first uh, few verses about what Paul did to Timothy to get him ready for for the, the journey, and you kind of go, oh, Timothy probably had some questions for Paul. Had, Paul had to circumcise him. So, yeah, had that going for him. And then, and then Luke, Luke may have been with him the entire time, but Luke's playing catch-up, and Luke, do you remember what Luke did for a living? He was a doctor, right? So you got to figure along the way, one of the things that was going on is Luke is basically stopping to help people along the way. <laughs> I never thought of that, but yes, I think, I think you are correct, sir. <laughs> Still, it is, it is one thing to trust God's guidance when it's obvious. It's still a very different thing when you seem to be walking in circles down a blind alley. And that's where they got, these guys found themselves. And then it got worse. Because our, 
God doesn't want them to go to Asia, but all, what about almost Asia? What about, what about Troas? That's sort of almost Asia. But they were wrong again. And this time Luke says the spirit of Jesus didn't let, let them. So there was only one way left. I'm sorry, I said, I said Troas there. Th th there was only one left, and that was Troas, which is where Troy is today, the archaeological digs of Troy on the coast of, of Turkey. And in verse 9 of chapter 16, we find this. One night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Macedonia is in Asia. It's in the upper areas. So it's in northern Greece. It's across the city. It's a totally new area for the gospel. The weeks of waiting and waiting and walking and wondering and praying were over. They now could go. They had a direction. In verse 11, we sailed from Troas to Philippi. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we, were suppo where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the woman, women who had gathered there. Now, normally the apostles would come to a new town and they would make the synagogue their base of operations. They were still Jews. They had no intention of separating from the Jewish faith. They wanted to reform the Jewish faith as Lutheranism sought to reform Catholicism. So they would go to the synagogue and they would use that as their base of operations. They would draw support from that synagogue and sometimes people would be receptive and sometimes they wouldn't. But in this particular situation, there was a problem because there was no synagogue in the city of Philippi. There was, however, an informal gathering of women down by the river outside the town for, that came together for a time of prayer and something along the lines of a Bible study. I mean, if you're, if you're studying the Jewish scrolls, you don't bring, your Bible would be about the size of this stage. You know, it's a scroll, so you've got to lay it out on something. So they didn't, they didn't bring a Bible along with them. Perhaps they memorized the text or, or, or however it worked. But in any case, this group was mainly composed, comprised of women, of women. And in verse 14, we meet the first person of change that we've come across, a woman named Lydia. <laughs> she was, Luke tells us, a worshiper of God. She was from the city of Thyatira, which is, again, cross, across the Bosphorus uh, in, in, um, in Turkey. And she was a dealer in purple cloth. Now, these are several things about Lydia that are intriguing. First of all, Luke says she was a, a worshiper of God. What, what typically a person like this would be called would be a God-fearer. So they, they weren't a Jew, but they were willing to learn. They were trying to figure out what, what was going on with this and what was this all about. So she is a God-fearer. For reasons that we'll unpack at a later time, people throughout the Greco-Roman world had begun to tire of the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers of the Greco-Roman world. They, their philosophies, Epicureanism and Stoicism, were the societal norms for their time. Lydia and the God-fearers were hungry for something else. They were hungry for a deeper meaning. So Luke says that she was a worshiper of God. She was from the city of Thyatira. She was a dealer in purple cloth. Why does he tell us this, and why is this important? Well, first of all, if she was a rich, cosmopolitan woman, how do we know this about her? Well, she lived in Macedonia, where they were, but she was from Thyatira, which was a distance away. She had two homes. Luke calls her a dealer in purple cloth. I don't know what you know about purple, but purple cloth, the dyeing process to create purple cloth is very, very expensive. So we learn something about her from that point. As a dealer in purple cloth, what we know about her is that she owned a high-end business because the costly dye process purple meant that only wealthy people 
could afford it. Imagine her, for example, to be the owner of high-end boutique in Beverly Hills. Lydia sold beautiful clothes to beautiful people. She was rich. She was independent. She was grappling with the emptiness of living for herself. So emptiness, the apostles told her, wasn't filled by separating from the world as the, as the Stoics and the, and the Epicurean philosophers taught. Nor was it discussed, as, as we discussed last week rather, as, as coming from following the laws of Judaism. Because the laws of Judaism were all focusing upon something particular that now had been fulfilled. And what is that? Jesus. It's a Sunday school answer. It was filled by Jesus who came to fulfill the law, to deepen us in life and enjoy, not to escape life, not to get out of life, but to embrace life, to be a part of life and joy. Because it was Jesus who lived a perfect life according to the law, Jesus who went to the cross for living that perfect life, Jesus who died for our sins, who took the curse so that our curse falls on him and his blessing falls on us. And that's what the, the apostles communicated to Lydia and these other women. And in verse 14, it says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what Paul was saying, and she and her household were baptized. Then, realizing the apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke had no synagogue in which to base their, their operations, and that his, he and his companions would spend much better time, have a much better time off uh, establishing a ministry if they were living in a home rather than an inn somewhere, she insisted on them staying with her. And verse 15 says, this little, little throwaway line, it says, she prevailed upon us. <laughs> Read between the lines there for a second. For whatever reason, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke did not want to stay with her. But Lydia was a strong woman, and she showed them the error of, her, of their ways. <laughs> Change person number one. Change person number two, verse 16. One day, as they were going to the place of prayer, we, there's Luke, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. There's, again, a lot to unpack here. Luke calls this little girl a pariaska, which basically means slave girl. Um, a word which defines her as a slave, a female slave, somewhere between the ages of 10 and 14. But she's not just a slave. Because what Luke does here, and it's not... It's not very well uh, brought out within our English translations of this. He uses a religious context of Greek mythology saying that she had the spirit of the python. The spirit of the python. And what that is, is it's referencing back to the oracle of Delphi. There's tons of mythology and connection to all of this within this. So what she is doing is she has become a medium not a small, not a large. She has become a medium with spirits speaking through her. But wait, there's more. Ancient people would have called her, are you ready for this? A ventriloquist. Because the Latin venter and, the, and, and loci literally means belly speaking. So an ancient ventriloquist were troubled people, they still are today, right? <laughs> kind of scary. Troubled people who acted bizarrely and spoke wildly, crying out, shrieking, speaking in different voices. If into your mind has come Linda Blair in The Exorcist, you're on the right track. So consider this young girl, 10, 14 years old or so, Lot. She was born, all right, obviously. She had parents. Where are her parents? They've gotten rid of her for whatever reason. Perhaps they couldn't afford her or 
she was too much problems, but they sold her into slavery. So she's rejected by her family. She's economically oppressed. She's exploited. She's making a great deal of money through her malady. She is a slave to her inner demons. She is, today we would call her a drug-addicted prostitute who's, uh, who's um, exploited by her pimps. This is the woman that Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke meet. Now, while this girl's actions were bizarre, what she said was true. Because there's no way that she would have made a living for her owners unless she had some sort of clair clairvoyant knowledge. And apparently, her knowledge extended somewhat to salvation. Verse 17, she followed Paul and us, crying out, these, men's are, these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. Is that weird to you? That, that a, a demon would know that? No. J James says that even Satan knows of Jesus. He doesn't like it, but he knows about it. So she's following around, talking about salvation, kind of a, a signboard. You know, it's sort of like on, on one level, you kind of go, well, this is kind of helpful. We have our own Barker. But verse 18 tells you something. She kept doing this for many days. <laughs> What's the most annoying sound in the world? <laughs> Can you imagine this? Everywhere they went, this girl is shrieking at them. So what happens in verse 18? Paul, very much annoyed, <laughs> turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out of her that very hour. This kind of makes Paul look a little bit of a jerk, doesn't it? I mean, just stop, just, just stop and think about it for a second. God bless that scared person as they head to St. Joe's. Because I love this. You can't make this stuff up. If you were to make it up, you, wouldn't, you would paint Paul as not quite the jerk that he seems to be. I mean, if I were writing this, you know, in this revisionist history, I, I might say, Paul, moved with compassion, <laughs> turned to this young girl and said, you poor benighted soul, in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, I have what you need. Be healed. Nope. Nope. He says, I can't stand this for one more minute. In Jesus, get better. <laughs> Stop bothering me. <laughs> Years ago, I, I told you recently that I used to be the coordinator at a program called Calvin Crest where I, um, I, I was responsible for an, an entire camp and I had, I was woken up one night by the screaming of a girl in the camp, which is never, when you're, when you're in charge of things, you never want to hear this. So I came, I, I, I was sitting, Carol and I were in bed, we were trying to figure out what was going on and all of a sudden he goes, and I, I jumped to the door and I ran over and opened up the door and this guy saying, he comes out, he goes, he says, you, you got to come now. She's on the road, and, and you've got to, oh, hurry, 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 and ran. <laughs> I'm going, what do I do now? So I threw my shoes on, walked out of my cabin, ran out of my cabin, looked around thinking, where is it coming from? We're in a canyon. It's hard to find out, but I finally found it, went down, and there, underneath the sign that said Calvin Crest, a unique program for a new, unique person in a unique place, was, were two of my staff, and a cabin counselor holding a girl down on the ground, yelling into her face. I said, what's going on? The optics of this are not good. And I pulled her off, and she's screaming at the top of her head. She's screaming, Beelzebub, the de devil has me. She's just like a 12-year-old, 13-year-old girl, not you know, very close to this girl's age. And she's screaming and yelling and screaming and yelling. And we, we, she's going to wake up the entire cabin, or entire camp, rather. 
We're trying to figure out what to do. And she would, she would scream for a while, and then she'd faint. Scream for a while, she'd faint. So we picked her up, and firemen carried her about a quarter, half a mile up to the nurse's station. And staying at the cab that week was a Baptist pastor, a Hispanic Baptist pastor from the Central Valley. And he's, he comes out, and his eyes are like this because she's screaming that Satan has taken over her. And he's figuring out, what do I do now? And he says, perhaps we need to do an exorcism. And I said, we don't need to do an exorcism. I turned to her and say, say, Jesus is Lord. And she says, Jesus is Lord. I said, see? <laughs> now, in the revisionist history of that story, I would have told you, I turned to her and I said, you poor benighted soul. <laughs> no. Both Pauls messed up. <laughs> of course, this girl's healing brought a malevolent force into play, but it's not the force that you think it is. The malevolent force was profit. P R O F I T. Verse 19. When her owners saw their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the marketplace before the authorities, saying, these men are disturbing our city. They're Jews who are advocating customs unlawful for Romans. They stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods, threw them into prison, and ordered the jailer, jail, jailer to keep them securely. And he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. When profit meets profit, bad stuff happens, right? When P-R-O-P-H-T, P-H-E-T, meets P-R-O-F-I-T, bad stuff happens. But God wasn't finished because he still got a jailer to change. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Man, to be a fly on the wall. What was that like? Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors opened and everybody's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword about to kill himself. But since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped, well, Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. The same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before him, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Four people's lives changed. The last one asks the question that probably all the other ones asked, what must I do to be saved? And of course, that's the question all preachers want their congregations to ask, right? We love it when somebody comes in and says, what do I have to do? Because at that point, we got something to say. And we get to lead y'all to Jesus. But the thing is, we're packing a lot of theological freight into a much larger container because the question of salvation would, in the way in which we often think of it, would be unusual for a first century pagan. A first century pagan, they had, they, their world had all sorts of theories about an afterlife. But they had nothing so precise as the life that we talk about of a 5th century, which developed in the 5th century rather, of a medieval heaven and hell scenario which dominated our less, later Western thought. When, I th when you think of salvation, you think about going to heaven, right? It's not the way the Bible thought of it. There's a heaven and a hell, but that's not what we thought about when we thought about sal sal salvation. It's just that 
That's, that's what the New Testament writers were not, they, that's not what they were talking about when they talked about being saved. Saved meant delivered from current problems. Illness, financial disaster, personal issues, catastrophe. So when, when you think about it, when you think about the idea that salvation is based upon this kind of a mindset, it, it sort of makes us want to translate this not as, what must I do to be saved? But more along the lines, will you please tell me how I can get out of this mess? And though we come to Christ for salvation, that's not something that happens a long time from now. Salvation happens now. That's the question we should all be asking. It's the question that Lydia was asking and the possessed slave. It's really the question that the owners of the possessed slave were asking. How can I get out of this mess? If we'll stop focusing on what happens when we die and start focusing on the now, we'll get deeper answers to questions than we've ever imagined. Because coming to Christ the way that Lydia and the possessed girl and the, and the jailer came to, that was a deepening of their lives now. Right now, not someday. Jesus sees the world in the mess that it is now. Global human rebellion, idolatry and sin, the corruption of human life and relationships, the throwing away of life, the pollution of our planet, worldwide systems of economic exploitation, our messy situation in the here and now, people in desperate need, people in sorrow and fear, people whose own deliberate sins set a barrier between themselves and God. But because Jesus is already reigning as Lord, the Christian worldview sees this as under the heading of the way the world currently is and how as opposed to the way the world will be when Jesus is reigning as Lord. He already is. And it's our job now to grow into that. It's our job to give money to Haiti. It's our job to, to be in relationships of healing. It's our job to, to believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ now, in the here and now. 